Hello, everybody. Hello. How are y'all doing today? Hope y'all are having a good day. We are coming up on Shabbat. Yes, it is. So guess what we're talking about today? Uh, I, I wonder. Mm -hmm. um, um, dinner? Shabbat. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're going to be talking about Shabbat tonight. So everybody go get your Bibles and get ready to do a Bible study. Tonight, we are going to be looking at Shabbat or the Sabbath in the Old Testament or the Tanakh. Tomorrow night, we are going to be looking at the New Testament, Shabbat or Sabbath in the New Testament. And so this is going to be a thorough Bible study because this is one that unfortunately has caused um, a lot of debate, a lot of problems over the years that a lot of people just don't seem to get i guess and they don't yet, necessarily think it's that important and yet scripture is very clear so yes we're going to be taking a look at the sabbath at shabbat, what we call shabbat so if i say shabbat i mean the sabbath okay um so we're going to be looking at, at shabbat and and discussing uh, why it's important but specifically out of the tanakh or old testament tonight but before we do that we're going to do our Omer count. What mm -hmm. night is it? Well, the way we're doing it is day, today is say day seven of week yes. one of the counting of the Omer. And uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and do it, I guess. I go right ahead. Okay. It says, uh, Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidshanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu al seferat ha-Omer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commandments and commanded us about the counting of the Omer. So that's we're day we're going through day seven. So it lines up with the with Pentecost and such as that. And it's it's the one that is you know once the sun goes down, it's the Sabbath. Yes. Because that's the that's the way the biblical calendar works. That's yeah. the way they count. You know, all the way back from Genesis chapter one, where it says there was evening and there was morning the first day. You know, so the the day in the in the biblical sense and the, for the Jewish people starts at sundown. It's not some arbitrary midnight that we talk about, but it's a it's a physical, defined, observable moment when one day is over and the next one begins. Right. And that's that's it's a lot more helpful than just waking up in the middle of the night saying, "Gee, I wonder if it's today or tomorrow." Let me look at the clock. Yeah. You know, a clock's got to tell us where we are in the day. And yet that's not the way God intended things to be. He intended us for us to just look outside and know. So when the sun goes down, we're in the next day. Mm -hmm. so. That's what's happening tonight. I mean, that's, that's again, that's what the, the sun, moon, and stars was all about. When you get to day four uh, of Genesis, it says... Um, there will be so, they will be for signs. He says, "Let lights in the expanse of the sky." This is Genesis one fourteen. Mm -hmm. Be for separating the day from the night. Uh, they that and that idea of separating is a very important concept in the scriptures, making a distinction, making a separation. Um, but uh, they will be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. They will uh, and that word for seasons. Uh, and we'll talk about this comes up a lot, but that word for seasons is not just talking about uh, spring, summer, fall, and winter. That word there for the seasons is the word moed mm -hmm. in Hebrew, which is talking about the festivals or the feast days. These are appointed times, appointed moments in the Lord. The, the, the sun, the moon, and the stars are all there to try and help uh, God's people know when God wants to meet with them. And, and that's a lot of it. You know, you heard him say a point in time. That's literally what the word means um, in Hebrew. The word moed means appointed times. So God has appointed times that he wants to spend with us. You know, it, it's, it's nice to know, ladies, that when, you know, you... Uh, how, when, when you're married, that your husband wants to spend time with you. And mm -hmm. if you go through the trouble of making him dinner and and getting a nice meal prepared, if he comes in and doesn't want anything to do with you, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. 
So these are appointed times that God has set aside because he wants to spend time with us. So if he's got everything ready, lined everything up for us to spend time with him, and we treat it as if we want nothing to do with it, that's a problem. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's like planning a wedding day. I mean, you, yes. you have, you, you pick your day and, and everything is gearing and going for that moment. And whether you're the bride or the groom, if the other one doesn't show up and just kind of forgets about it or doesn't <laughs> think, it, oh, well, I thought we meant tomorrow or or some other time i mean that's that would be a big deal uh for uh the husband or the wife to not show up to the wedding day um because they just didn't think it mattered which day you came on so yeah that that idea of it being an appointed time is very important it's actually very essential to understanding the Shabbat as well as the rest of the feast. Mm-hmm. We're not going to talk about the rest of the feast tonight. We're going to focus specifically on Shabbat. Uh, it might be a whole nother week before we get to the rest of the feast. So um, let's let's dive into Shabbat with Genesis chapter 2. Okay. Okay. And, you know, this is the word Sabbath is not actually used there in, here in Genesis no. chapter 2, but it introduces the, the concept and it introduces the pattern. You know, God, you know, in talking about the Sabbath, God is not asking us to do anything that he himself does not do and does not establish in his role, in his function of things. So Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 says, So the heavens and the earth were completed along with their entire array. God completed on the seventh day his work that he made, and he ceased on the seventh day from all his work that he made. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, or separated it, set set it apart. Uh, For on it he ceased from all his work that God created for the purpose of preparing. Right. Actually, my my version that I've got um, is a little bit different. I I like the way it says it because it says that God blessed the seventh day and separated it as holy. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, he said, this day is holy. It is completely set apart for you because, well, let me back up for a second. When when we celebrate Shabbat, one of the things that we talk about is separating the holy from the common. Mm -hmm. And when we go into that Shabbat, when we go, when we go into the Sabbath, we are leaving Common, ordinary, everyday. Um, fix sorry, over Kelly's here. fixing his camera on the restoration site. But when, when we go into that um, time period, uh, you're messing my thinking all up. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was uh, bugging me. I completely understand. Okay, so yeah, when, when we go into that time period of the Sabbath, we are leaving what is common. Okay. What is ordinary? We're putting ordinary aside for one day and we are spending it completely in the holy presence of God. Mm -hmm. And that's important. That's important for us. I mean, that's, that's, that's something that he wants. This is a day that he is setting aside. Again, he is establishing the pattern. When you think of of the, the, the day, we understand a day because of its uh, because of its astronomical significance, you know, there's one rotation of the earth. And so when the sun comes up, you know, the sun comes down and it comes all the way around to where it goes down again. Uh, that we understand as one whole day. And we understand the year as typically as one, you know, rotation of the planet around the sun. And that establishes the year based on, uh, based upon that astronomical movement. Uh, we understand the moon, uh, especially in biblical times. The, the moon was the cycle of, I'm sorry, the month was the cycle of the lunar cycle. So from one new moon to another. So you have all of these astronomical indicators for measuring time. The one thing that we don't have uh, an astronomical signal for is the Sabbath. The, the week. It's just the week. There is nothing that marks it. There's nothing that indicates it in the heavens or through through anything that's really out there. The only reason that we have a week, 
a concept of a week at all is because of God establishing and setting that pattern here. And he is saying, you know, I am going to take, you know, of all the things that I can be doing, of all the things that I, that there is to do, I'm going to stop all of that and set this time aside uh, and make sure that I spend it with those that I love. Make sure I spend it with my creation, my, my children, my people. I mean, that, that would, how many kids long for that from yeah, their parents? I'm sure a, a lot do. I'm sure a lot do. I mean, we can, we can get so overrun. We can get so uh, busy. We can, you know, we are, we could be workaholics by nature if we let it and stopping enough to spend time with our families. This is something that our culture has in a lot of ways forgotten about and has gotten away from. Yes. Yeah. And something we need to get back to. Mm -hmm. But the next time we see the Sabbath being discussed in scripture is actually, you, you might assume that the next time we see it is actually when the commandment for the Sabbath is given in Exodus chapter 20. However, that is not the case. The next time we actually see Sabbath being discussed is Exodus chapter 16. It is after they leave Egypt, but it is before they get to the mountain. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is when God gives the manna and he gives them instructions on how to gather the manna. Mm -hmm. And he tells them, gather only so much for the day. Don't keep any. Leftover, you know, this would have been great in terms of, oh, I don't like leftovers, right? Because there were no such thing as leftovers, except when you go on the sixth day of the week, gather enough for two days so that you would not be going out on the Sabbath, on the seventh day and gathering manna for your family. So, because that was an act of work. And so here you have this concept of Sabbath before he even officially gives them the Sabbath. Yeah. How is and that so possible? he is calling back on on the account out of creation. Mm -hmm. You think you think how could how could they already know even what the Sabbath is? I mean, right. here they are, they're they're hundreds of years removed from being a free people. Uh, and yet they still know and understand what the Sabbath is. They still under, know and understand uh, that uh, there are seven days and, and that seventh day is a Sabbath. Now, obviously, not all of them knew that. Not all of them really took it seriously. Not all of them cared about it because some, you know, if you remember, they went out on the seventh day in the morning and started collecting manna and such as that. And it didn't really work out so well there for them. There wasn't any. Yeah, there wasn't any. And and if they if they kept more than a day's worth, on any other day, if you remember, uh, it all turned to worms and such. It all decayed and, and was not, you're not able to keep it. So they went out on the Sabbath and there was none to be found. So, and there's no explanation for that. You know, there's no way to explain it. How can something, a, a natural phenomenon, if you're going to try to explain this miracle away of the provision of the manna, you know, how is it that there's a mechanism that works six days, but every seventh day just stops? <laughs> yeah. It's, this is not like Old Faithful where it's every hour. And imagine if you went to Yellowstone National Park and Old Faithful worked every hour, but never erupted once you know, on the Sabbath. <laughs> and then it started back up again at, at sundown. Like clockwork. Yeah. They, they would work to the bone to try to figure that one out. Uh, but I don't think they would be able to. No. And, and also, you know, with, with the gathering of the daily manna, think about what we call the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeshua's model prayer for us. Give us this day our daily bread. This day. He's hearkening back to the idea of when they were in the wilderness and gathering bread every single day, except for the Shabbat. Because the Shabbat was meant to rest, and it was meant to rest with God and family. Mm -hmm. And you really even had to trust him. Yes. You, you had to trust him there to gather a... the two days worth that yes. is actually going to work. Right. Uh, and that it's actually going to keep. Uh, because it, it doesn't make logical sense, and yet it does. I mean, yet the Lord makes it happen. And so the Sabbath was something that even though it was mentioned there in Genesis... 
And even before they came to Mount Sinai, the, the Jewish people were still uh, in, had a knowledge of to an extent. They still they might not have known all the details of what the Lord expected or required, but they still knew enough. And, and the, the manna established what the seventh day was. I mean, I know there are some people who question, well, they'd lost track of what was the seventh day. Well, the manna established that. And, you know, right away, God is also establishing the fact that his people are special to him because he was he was reminding them of of that day of rest, of that Sabbath day. And you think back into e in Egypt, they weren't allowed to have that day of rest. They were slaves. Slaves don't get that. You're not paid hired help. You're a slave. You know, you do what I tell you to do when I tell you to do it. And more than likely, they were even forced to worship Egyptian gods. So God is saying, no, you're special to me. I want you to take time just to be with me. Mm -hmm. And how radical that would have been for them coming out of slavery. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. But let's, let's go to the next time we see the Sabbath discussed in Scripture, and that is the commandments. Okay? We find the Ten Commandments in two places in the Torah, in the books of Moses, we find it in Exodus 20, and we find it in Deuteronomy 5. And it's a little different in both. However, in discussing the Ten Commandments, I think it's important to note that the way we number the commandments in traditional Protestant church, or and even Catholics have a different numbering system for the commandments, but the way we number it is not the way the Jewish people number the commandments. We actually completely leave out their number one. Mm -hmm. Okay. The first commandment is actually verse two. I am Adonai, the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the abode of slavery. <clears throat> the very first commandment establishes Who's in charge? Mm -hmm. who, 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 who's, who they're they're in relationship with? Who's their sovereign? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Who they're in relationship with? Yeah. It's it's kind of naming the party of the first part, so to speak, within a contract, <laughs> and the party of the second part. Right? Sorry, it's a little movie humor there for those of you who've who've seen The Quiet Man. You know what I'm talking about, but. Um, that's, that's basically what that is. The party, party of the first part is God and the party of the second part are the people he brought out of Egypt. And by the way, he brought them out of Egypt. He redeemed these people. He has done something for him. He has proved himself to them. Mm -hmm. And, and so you, you have, you have that is the very first commandment. What we typically in at least Protestant circles call one and two, they combine together because both of those involve idolatry, mm -hmm. okay? You're to have no other gods before me, not even anything you make with your own hands, mm -hmm. right? No graven images. That's all about idolatry. Then we have the commandment about taking the name Maybe of the, the Lord, Lord lightly or in vain. And then we come to number four, which is? Remember Yom Shabbat. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy or separate, distinct, you are to work six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Shabbat to Adonai, your God. In it you shall not do any work, not you, you nor your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your cattle, nor the outsider that is within your gates. For in six days Adonai made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Thus Adonai blessed Yom Shabbat, the Sabbath day, and made it holy. Yes. And so you'll see in that it's not it's you know it's uh, it's about everything that you are responsible for. That is that is what you know the Sabbath is is intended as a household as a as a people. You know it's everything. You know, you're not you, your son, your daughter. Your servants, you can't make somebody do the work all for you. Mm -hmm. You know, on the Sabbath day, your cattle, your animals, everything, even the outsider, even the person who is not, you know, um, not uh, one of your people, but uh, who is, 
you know, still there with you, who has joined himself to you. That's really what it's all about. And it's and it's hearkening back again to creation. And he blesses this seventh day. He, God himself rested on this day. He blesses it and separates it and just makes it distinguished. That's one reason why there's in, in the Jewish life today, you know, there's the, the lighting of the candles yes. uh, in order to, to separate this day from the others. Uh, some will even go out and blow the shofar uh, on uh, to begin the Sabbath as a way of distinguishing and separating the Sabbath day. Uh, something that, that makes you realize that this is a special time that's starting. Yeah, that you're entering into a holy time. Because we, you know, time is a commodity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't realize that. Sometimes we just want to make things the commodity and it's all about stuff. It, it may be all about what I do, but time is also sacred yes, it is. to God. And so, yeah, we, we want to separate that time and say, okay, this is for God. This is for God and God alone. And in and, and Deuteronomy, when we come to the Sabbath again with the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy, when Moses is repeating it, when Moses is giving those speeches, the, the day before 40 years he later. dies, or the day that he dies. And this is 40 years later. 40 years later. He's not going to tie it to creation this time. The first time, God tied it to creation. Here, Moses um, ties it to uh, the fact that they were slaves in Egypt. Verse 15 of Deuteronomy 5 says, You are to remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And Adonai, your God, brought you out from there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. Strong hand, the mighty hand, and the outstretched arm. Therefore, Adonai, your God, has ordered you to keep the day of Shabbat, or keep the Sabbath day. Because you were slaves, and he redeemed you. So we're not just remembering him from creation anymore. We are remembering his redemption in mm -hmm. our lives. Yeah. That's, that's what Sabbath is for, to remind us of redemption. That, and that's huge. That, that's really huge. It's because, again, you think about that mighty hand and outstretched storm. We typically think of that as language referring to Yeshua when he died on the cross. But here... That language is being tied to the Exodus when God redeemed them out of slavery from Egypt. Remember that slavery in Egypt was, you know, on, on the spiritual level, you might say, is, a, is akin to uh, slavery to sin. Mm -hmm. Right. So and that's kind of how the New Testament deals with it in parts. But yeah. That slavery to sin, that slavery to Egypt, that slavery we have to the world. No, God redeems us from sin. God redeems us from this world. God redeems us from everything that keeps us from him. Mm -hmm. Because remember, the whole, purpose is, the whole purpose of him bringing them out, Moses kept saying it over and over again, so that the people could worship God. That's right. And that's an important distinction, you know, because, you know, it, it's the Sabbath is about a recognition of God's redemption. Typically, when we talk about, you know, in, in the church history and things like that, that the reason why the, the day was changed from Sabbath to Sunday is in commemoration or recognition of the resurrection. Well, the resurrection is all about our salvation. It's all about our redemption. Yeah. And so we, we, church history decided to make that change from one day to the next because they were thinking that this will help us remember our redemption better. But if the Sabbath was supposed to be a reminder of our redemption all along, it was always supposed to be about that. And right. that's something that we, we forgot to mention last night when we were talking about uh, replacement theology you know, is that if you remember, you know, is that all the promises uh, to the Jewish people, to Israel have been, you know, negated and those promises have been transferred to what was the Gentile church. Well, that that understanding and that that theology was the foundation for the decisions that were made to distance 
the, the body of Christ from the Jewish people. It justified changing the Sabbath. It justified uh, divorcing from the, the feast days and, and creating the new holidays that we celebrate now on the Christian calendar. So that replacement theology was the foundational thinking for doing all of that. Yes. And yes, but yes. what we realize is that some of the reasons that we did it for, like changing from Saturday to Sunday, from Sabbath to Sunday, is God already had that that as the foundation of it anyway, our redemption. It was always supposed to be the reminder that we once were slaves, slaves to Egypt, slaves to sin, and we have been redeemed. That's what we're supposed to focus on and remember every Sabbath. Amen to that. Amen to that. So yeah, we have we have the two accounts of the Sabbath from the commandments, the one in Exodus and then the one in Deuteronomy. Now let's um, go back for a minute and let's go to Exodus 31 because this is a very important passage that talks about the Sabbath and what it is supposed to be in the life of, of Israel and of, a rede of the redeemed people, okay? So, and this is actually a passage that we refer to or, or make mention of mm -hmm. uh, in all of our Sabbath services, just as a reminder of things. Yes. So if we want to look at starting in verse, uh, where do I want to go back to? I want to go back to verse 12. Okay. In verse 12, it says, Adonai said to Moses, tell the people of Israel, you are to observe my Sabbaths. Okay, and he says it plural there because he's referring actually to all of them, not just the weekly Sabbath. Uh, for this is a sign between me and you through all your generations, so that you will know that I am Adonai who sets you apart for me. He is Adonai. Remember, we talked about what the first commandment actually is. The first commandment is that he is God. He is the one who has redeemed. He is the one that called the people out of Egypt. And that's the first thing um, that we are to remember, right? So it sets us apart for him. It sets the people of Israel. It sets the people of God apart for him. Verse 14, therefore, you are to keep my Shabbat, my Sabbath singular the weekly sabbath because it is set apart for you he has set that apart for us we have not set that apart for him he's done the setting apart mm -hmm. he's saying come and join me right everyone who treats it as ordinary must be put to death for whoever does any work on it is to be cut off from his people. On six days, work will, will get done. But on the seventh day, it is a Shabbat for complete rest set apart for Adonai. Whoever does any work on that day, on the day of Shabbat, must be put to death. The people of Israel are to keep the Sabbath, the Shabbat to observe Shabbat through all their generations as a perpetual covenant. That means it's going to keep going forever. It's an ever, ongoing. Ever. It's never it's going not, to stop. It's not going to come to an end just mm -hmm. all of a sudden. It's never going to stop. It is a sign between me and the people of Israel forever. For in six days, Adonai made heaven and earth. But on the seventh day, he stopped working and rested. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. This this right here is, is huge because you have here this, this perpetual covenant, this covenant that's going to last forever between God and the people of Israel and those who join with Israel, that it is a sign between them and God. That they are his forever. Mm -hmm. Forever. And it's and each generation is supposed to participate this. And you know, throughout your generations, every generation is supposed to keep this going. It's not supposed to be something that is forgotten. It's not supposed to be something that is neglected. 
And it's just, it's a powerful thing. And so if you're somebody who can, you know, considers yourself a creationist, you know, you believe <laughs> that, that God created, you know, the earth and, uh, and uh, that you think that that's one of the defining issues, then you should be uh, intimately interested in the Sabbath because it's only in creation. It's only in that story. Again, as we mentioned about earlier, it's only in the creation account that establishes the pattern of Sabbath at all. Yes. Without it, there's no sun, moon, or stars that, that signifies or marks out the Sabbath is just the fact that creation. So if when you keep the Sabbath, you are actually testifying that you believe that Genesis chapter one and two, you actually believe that God created this universe and this planet and this place where we live. So it, Sabbath is, is not only that testimony, you know, to, to him of who, of he is our God, you know, it's it's not only that thing that is set apart, it's also testifying that we believe his word. Yes. Uh, and that's important because in one of the ways that this puts this, um, you know, it says, you know, you are to observe the Shabbat throughout your gen their generations as a perpetual, you know, ongoing covenant. And then it says, mine says, it is a sign between me and B'nai Yisrael. Uh, and you you get to thinking about that is like, what is the it referring to? You know, it's just a, a pronoun. <laughs> It is a sign, uh, and the it is actually refer actually referring to their observation of it, their keeping of it. Your keeping the Shabbat, that is the sign. So it's not the Shabbat itself. It's, it's not the it's, Shabbat it's itself the that's the sign. Of the Shabbat. That's right. The, the keeping of the Shabbat is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. You know, if, if you consider yourself one of the children of Israel, and if you are a believer in Yeshua, the Messiah, you are a descendant of Abraham. Yes. So you should consider yourself one of the children of Israel because you have been grafted into that people. We talked about that the other day with what replacement theology is all about and how the Gentiles have been brought in and really what that means. But the keeping of Shabbat is a sign that we are one of his people. And that word for sign is the word oath. Uh, it's a, a, the Hebrew word, and it literally means, uh, you know, a, a miraculous sign, a, a, a standard proof is one of the translations or one of the definitions for it. But it also says that it is a, a banner or a, in particular, a distinguishing mark, <laughs> a distinguishing mark. Does the, the enemy have a distinguishing mark? I believe the the enemy does have a mark. And, and what's God's distinguishing mark? Uh, wow! So the enemy has a mark of that we call the mark of the the beast. beast. Yes, and and these w this mark is not so much of a even so much of a, of a tattoo or a, a microchip, which is what you hear a lot about even these days coming up. The mark that this is kind of referring to is, is your practice, is your observance of certain things. That is the mark. That is the distinguishing sign that sets you apart as the people of God. And the enemy has his own way of life. The enemy has his own mark and practices that his people practice. Right, right. And sets them apart from God's people. So the, the Sabbath is one of those things that is a sign or is a signal, is a distinguishing mark that sets apart God's people from the enemy's people. And, and that's interesting because you heard that the penalty for not keeping the Sabbath is death. Well, what is this? What is he? What has he said here about the Sabbath? That it is a sign between me and you that I am your God. Right, that I brought you out of Egypt, that I have redeemed you. If you don't really believe that, you might as well be dead. Mm -hmm. There's because there's no life without understanding who He is and what He has done for mm -hmm. us. And if you don't bear His mark in your life, in your lifestyle, in your practice, then you are still dead in your sin. Yes. You know, and that's that's that shows, or that's a demonstration that you've not been redeemed. And so you can see how how our theology over the centuries has gotten this in completely backwards. We don't have the right to change this. No yeah. one has the authority to change what he established and what he did. 
uh, and because that's changing his sign, that's changing this mark. You know, only the king has the authority. Only the ruler of the universe has the, the authority to set the calendar and to set his mark and what defines his people. And so we don't have the authority and they didn't have it in the early church to change the day. You, really. you know, what, one thing that's interesting too is that he, he talks about it, that it was God who made the heaven and earth. And in the Torah, God says that heaven and earth are witnesses against you. Mm -hmm. They stand as witnesses. So the witnesses are still in place. Heaven mm -hmm. and earth are still in place. They are the witnesses that for or against God's people. Mm -hmm. and, and we are not saying at all that if you go to church on Sunday, no. <laughs> that, that you are not God's. But this is, this is the language that God himself used. This is how God chose to describe the Sabbath and this holy time with him, that it was completely set apart. It was a, a distinguishing mark upon his people. And unfortunately, in church circles, we have ignored God's distinguishing mark. We have ignored that time when God says, I'm going to show up. Come be with me. Come be with me. That to me is just something that is incredible. Mm -hmm. That the God of the universe, the God who created heaven and earth wants to have anything to do with me. Because I know me. You know, I know me. why does God want to have anything to do with me? Mm -hmm. And yet he calls us to his side on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And and like she was saying, you know, not only, do, you know, that's not a, it's not a salvation type of issue. And that by no means means that you can't worship on other days. You can't, you, we can, we do have the freedom to worship on Sunday. We do have the freedom to work on or worship on any day. And every day. And every day, and we should. But by all means, things have to be different on the Sabbath. Yes. That's yes. really what it's saying. It's saying that this day is, is special. It's set aside exclusively for the things of God, exclusively for the things of his kingdom, exclusively for meeting with him, first of all, and with each other. And just because we worship any other day of the week, which we are perfectly free to do and God wants us to do does not mean we have permission to ignore the one day where he has said, come worship me, mm -hmm. right? Come be with me. Come rest with me. I mean, there's a reason why it says, remember the Sabbath. Right. And that's the yes. only one that it describes that as. Oh, well, and, yeah. and and the reason why it's a remember is that it has to be a purposeful, intentional uh, thought process. It, it can get away from you. It can skip you. You can you can forget all about it because again, there's nothing that that establishes this as a defined moment. And so you have to in, be intentional about keeping the Sabbath. Uh, especially in, ways, in today's culture. Especially in today's culture, because there are so many distractions. There are so many things that, if you if you think about it as a strategy, the enemy is deliberately putting as much on, uh, much good things, much fun things as possible mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the day that God wants you to say, no, I don't want you to do those things. The enemy is going to try to fill it up with other stuff so that you'll forget, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be with the Lord today. Yeah. And, and that's a very effective strategy. And, and it has been. But, you know, I, I know we've talked before how nice it, it must be for those who actually live in the land of Israel, where Sabbath is everybody's doing it or the, the shops close, everything shuts down and and it's Shabbat. And it's interesting, you know, one of the things that has come out of all of this crisis in our world right now, one of the first things I saw once Israel went into lockdown was people celebrating Shabbat from their balcony tops, mm -hmm. singing the songs of Shabbat, singing the Shema together. And all of a sudden, God has enforced a, 
upon the, the world, <laughs> the Shabbat. Mm-hmm. And so, does God take this seriously? Absolutely. Yes, he does. Absolutely. He certainly does. All right. So, let's move on to, I, I want us to go to Isaiah. Okay. Okay. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. And you might be thinking, wait a minute, what does Isaiah have to say about the Sabbath? Well, Isaiah 56 is very important. It comes not long after, it comes not long after Isaiah 53, where it talks about the suffering servant, right? Mm -hmm. And where did Philip start with the Ethiopian eunuch from in the book of Isaiah? In the book of Acts. I'm sorry, but, well, in the, well, in Acts, in the book of Isaiah, because the Ethiopian eunuch was reading, reading from the, the scroll book of Isaiah. of Isaiah, or the scroll of Isaiah. So he started in Isaiah 53. Well, at that point in time, you know, they didn't have chapters. He just kept reading, right? And we have here in Isaiah 56, God discussing two specific groups of people that if they keep the Shabbat, they are children to him. Mm -hmm. And those two groups of people are eunuchs, interestingly enough. So do you sure. think Philip got to this passage? I bet he was headed here right from oh, the back. Oh, wow. I, I would have a hard time thinking he didn't go to this passage. Okay. So yeah, Isaiah 56 talks about eunuchs celebrating the Sabbath. And it also talks about foreigners celebrating the Sabbath mm -hmm. and the importance of, of that. So let's let's go down to verse 6 where it starts with the foreigners, because I know most of us listening today are Gentiles. After all, there's more Gentiles in the world than there are Jews in the world. And so let's let's look at um, Isaiah 56, verse 6. You want to read that? All right, it says, Also the foreigners who join themselves to Adonai, which is would qualify as us, who yes. Gentiles who have believed in Messiah, uh, the foreigners who join themselves to Adonai to minister to him and to love the name of Adonai, and to be his servants, all who keep from profaning Shabbat and hold fast to my covenant, because that's what we've been made a part of. Uh, these I will bring to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Does anybody <laughs> recognize that passage? Oh, you who, who, said, who said that? Uh, Yeshua said that <laughs> when he was... Pushing out the money changers, remember? Yes. He said his house was supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. Okay. So he says, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, Adonai Elohim, who gathers the dispersed of Israel, the gathering of the dispersed of Israel. Oh, well, that's something we're still looking forward to fully seeing. Uh, declares, I will gather still others to him, to those already gathered. So, I mean, that's, a, that's just a powerful, powerful statement about how this invitation, even to the foreigners, to join themselves to the Lord, and one of the ways that we demonstrate, or one of the ways that we show, or the sign that we have joined ourselves to Adonai, is that we no longer, because we were, obviously we would have been doing it before, but we are no longer profaning the Shabbat, and we're holding fast mm -hmm. to the covenant. Yeah. That we have been made a part of. That is what uh, grafting in to the people of Israel is really all about. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up just a little bit and okay. go to that because the, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch has become one of my favorites because of this connection to, uh, to Isaiah 56. When you really look at it, because, I mean, you, you can imagine it, there's, there's, there's elements within the Torah that that talk about a eunuch is not allowed a eunuch is not allowed to go in and participate in the the temple service and the and to do the things that everybody else is because they have been injured or for whatever you know whatever they were, reason they were made a eunuch there was there was a, a command saying that they could not participate so here's this guy from ethiopia he's coming as a representative of his government all the way uh, up to Jerusalem, and there's, there's, he's wanting to, to experience this culture. He's wanting to experience this people, and he comes to the temple and says, I want to, to learn about it. I want to participate in it and represent my country, 
in the temple and he's and he's told he, the the door is closed to him essentially and said no you cannot because you are a eunuch you know he would have been very frustrated he would have probably gone away very sad discontented you know and so he's headed all the way back home and he's he's bought some of the scrolls he's brought bought some of the uh, the things to take back with him to Isaiah the scroll of Isaiah and he's reading it um, so he's, he's learned Hebrew apparently, or if it's in Greek, maybe as it may be the Septuagint, I'm not sure what he would have had exactly, but it says in verse three, back in chapter 56, and listen to this hope that, that Philip would have been able to give to him after starting in Isaiah 53 and explaining the identity of Messiah and what he has done. Then he comes over here to verse 50, chapter 56. He says, do not, do not let a son of a foreigner who has joined himself to Adonai, say, Adonai will surely exclude me from his people. That was this eunuch's experience in Jerusalem. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says Adonai to the eunuchs who keep my Shabbatot, my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me. This is what he was there for. Uh, and hold fast to my covenant. I will give to them, to, to eunuchs like that, I will give to them in my house and within my walls. So mm -hmm. he is going to be granted access. And uh, he's, I'm going to give them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name that is better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. Mm -hmm. I mean, that so much of that language is all about the eunuch who has been denied, who will never have children, who is who thinks that I'm done. There, I have no legacy. I have nothing that I can pass on, and yet I'm going to have a name that will never die. And that is, and so when 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 Philip gets to that point with the Ethiopian eunuch after he had been denied, and he's reading something like that, that's when the eunuch comes out and basically exclaims, "Is there anything that is preventing me or keeping me from being baptized?" Uh, and Philip looks around and says, well, look, here's some water. Let's go for it. Yeah. You know, the, you are no longer restricted or you, you have permission to come to Messiah. The good news that would have been to him. Oh, my goodness. He would have rejoiced. Oh, yes. And, oh, yes. and the Sabbath and the covenant is a part of that. Yeah. Sure is. It sure is. All right. So that's Isaiah 56. Now. Let's go to Isaiah 58, okay? So the foreigner and the eunuch who keep Shabbat and the Sabbath are accepted by God. Let's go to Isaiah 58, because Isaiah 58, a, a lot of this chapter is dealing with um, specifically the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. But I want us to look at how this chapter ends, starting in verse 13. If you hold back your foot on Shabbat... From pursuing your own interests on my holy day. Do we have our own interests? Yeah, we do. Does God know that? Yeah, he does. Right? But on his holy day, hold back. Hold back from those interests. Right? All right. So, if, if you call Shabbat a delight, Adonai's holy day, worth honoring, then honor it by not doing your usual things or pursuing your interests, or speaking about them. If you do, you will find delight in Adonai. I will make you ride on the heights of the land and feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of Adonai has spoken. Mm. So yeah, the Sabbath is a delight. It is supposed to be a joy. It is not a day for our interests. It's not a day for conversations we want to have that we consider fun. This is a day that is completely about him, completely about honoring him and honoring what he has done in our lives. And that's, and that's important because so many times we get mixed up on the Sabbath and we only think of the list of things that we can't do. We only think of all of those things. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do this. I'm restricted. I'm, you know, and, and all those things. And really all it's saying is it's not so much a, a, a things of what you can't do is it's saying, this is what I want you to do. Yeah. You know, it's it, her translation puts it well is about pursuing your own interests. 
you know, we have a life that we want to live where we want to build essentially our own kingdom. We need, we need to, to make money for our family. We need to put food on the table. We have, you know, crops. We have, uh, business. We have all of these other types of things that, that have our attention and need our attention rightfully. Yes. yes. Uh, and, and we have, we have all the other days to, to worry about those things, to pursue after our own kingdom. But for one day a week, he's saying, I don't want you to worry about your kingdom. I want you to think about mine. I want you to think about the kingdom of God. I want you to think about your relationship with me because it's no, I don't want this day to be about you and what your worries and concerns are, your burdens. I want you to take up his yoke because his yoke is easy. His burden is light. You know, the Sabbath is supposed to be our, our attention focused on him. So it's, it's the things that we can do on Shabbat are the things for and about God, the things of God, the things that honor and glorify him, the things that save life, yes. the things that preserve life and, and, and care for other people. You know, you know, it's, you can, you know, the, the priests serving in the temple, uh, were still working. They were working very hard on Shabbat. Mm, yes. I mean, they had to, they had a job to do. And it was okay for them to do it on Shabbat because it wasn't about building their own kingdom. It was about representing and honoring and bringing glory to God. We are free to do those things on Shabbat. And sometimes it might be, it might make you sweat. (laughs) And that's all right. That's all right. It's about what you are doing for the kingdom of God. And that's that's what Shabbat is for. And it, it becomes a delight because it, it, you're focusing on something other than yourself. Hmm. Yeah, and, and if you if you go to Jeremiah chapter 17, um, Shabbat uh, was very, very important to God with his people. And I, I remember when we first started looking at Shabbat and one of the things that was um, that continued to be said when people would ask well what can you or can't you do on Shabbat was uh, buy and sell Mm -hmm. you know and typically the passage people go to for buying and selling is Nehemiah Uh, and what he he talks about uh, closing the gates Mm-hmm. After they return from from their Babylonian exile, apparently they're not honoring Shabbat the way they should. And he's close the gates. Just close the gates. Nobody bring anything in here to sell. Nobody. Well, we kind of tie that particular rule to Nehemiah. But actually, let's go back for a minute and, and let's go to Jeremiah Chapter 17. And Jeremiah is before or after the exile? Jeremiah is before the oh, exile. He's before, the before exile. the exile. And it's it's interesting because uh, in in uh, Jeremiah 17, Adonai says, starting in verse 21, if you value your lives, don't carry anything on Shabbat or bring it in through the gates of Jerusalem. Adonai is saying that. God is saying that. God is saying, no, this is not the day you bring stuff in to buy or sell. This is not a business day. Don't carry anything out of your houses on Shabbat. Don't even, don't, don't go looking to sell something. And don't do any work. Instead, make Shabbat a holy day. I ordered your ancestors to do this. I ordered your ancestors not to do these things, basically. This is how I wanted them to honor the Shabbat. Well, we don't necessarily have that specific command within the Torah, but obviously Moses must have communicated that to the people about how God wanted things to be done on Shabbat, what he did and did not want them to do. You know, you don't take something out of your tent and go over to your neighbor's tent and sell it to your neighbor on Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Not permissible. Right. Uh, Instead, make Shabbat a holy day. I ordered your intercessors to do this. I read that already. But they neither listened nor paid attention. Rather, they stiffened their necks so that they wouldn't have to hear 
or receive instruction. However, if you will pay careful heed to me, says Adonai, and carry nothing through the gates of this city on Shabbat, but instead make Shabbat a day which is holy and not for doing work, then kings and princes occupying the throne of David will enter through the gates of this city, riding in chariots and on horses. They, their princes, the people of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will enter, and this city will be inhabited forever. Hmm. They will come from the cities of Judah, from the places surrounding Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, and from the Sephelah, from the hills, and from the Negev, bringing burnt offerings, sacrifices, grain offerings, frankincense, and thanksgiving sacrifices to the house of Adonai. But if you will not obey me and make Shabbat a holy day, and not carry loads through the gates of Jerusalem on Shabbat, then I will set its gates on fire. It will burn up the palaces of Jerusalem and not be quenched. So what is God saying here? What What is he tying to the kings being on the throne forever? Sounds like the Sabbath. They're keeping, keeping of the Sabbath. And taking it seriously. Yes, their observance of mm -hmm. the Sabbath. Remember, you because talked about that the being sign. the sign, mm -hmm. right? And so he's, we want the king to be on the throne forever. We long for that. We can't wait for that. And so since we were talking about the kingdom and what the kingdom is going to look like, you know, we were doing that on Wednesday night because mm -hmm. Wednesday night is kingdom night. You know, that's kind right. of we're talking about that in this time. Uh, that tells you that when there is going, to, when there is a king on the throne of David dwelling in Jerusalem forever, that's talk. That's a reference to what the kingdom life will be like. And yes. so, in the kingdom, what does that say about how they practice the Sabbath? Well, let's let's go back to Isaiah. Oh, well, wait, wait. Oh, yeah, because I want I wanted to say, say uh, yeah, I wanted to say something first that, on that. The answer to your question is actually. Also okay, Isaiah, so, so put that on hold put for just hold. a second, Sorry. because this statement here about not not carrying any through, anything through the gates, uh, you know mm -hmm. that that comes up in the in the New Testament, you know, that kind of argument, that that whole thing about uh, the man who is is healed on the Shabbat, and, and Jesus tells him specifically, pick up your mat and walk. And then the, the, the leadership sees him. Uh -oh. oh, we might have lost. Oh, there, we go. there we go. But, you know, the leadership sees him carrying his mat. And they're like, what are you doing? You're not supposed to carry your mat on Shabbat. It, it's built out of a, this passage and things like this. But uh, under normal circumstances, you know, he shouldn't be carrying things, right? Because if he was just conducting business for himself, then they would be right that he shouldn't be carrying and conducting business. But why is this man not carrying what not breaking the Sabbath on this particular day in this particular? If he if he a next Sabbath if he if he comes in the next week seven days later and he's carrying his mat through Jerusalem, then things might be different. But this day, this day he this man is not breaking the Sabbath because what is his life doing in that moment? It is glorifying God because he has just been healed. Been he restored. Is, he has been restored. He Everything about his existence has changed, and he is proclaiming the kingdom of God in every step that he takes. And he's taking that mat. He's not coming out of his house with that mat to do something, excuse me, to do some type of business with that mat. He's taking that mat home to rest on the Sabbath. His body is finally at rest mm -hmm. and he can go home he can take what he's had to lay on and go home and rest with his family mm -hmm. remember the sabbath is also about life and honoring and celebrating yes. life and restoring that which is broken and everything about that man is, is testifying to that and so it's just a powerful uh thing a powerful reminder about uh, all that he is doing and all that he is saying. So, I, and I just I had to get that out there 
before we we jump somewhere else. So the question was about the the the, the kingdom. kingdom. And the, and the, in survive. the kingdom, the Sabbath will be operating because that's when the king is on the throne and forever. Jerusalem is inhabited forever. That means the, the, the practice and the observance and the, the, the sign or mark of the Sabbath is going to be in effect. Yes. So you were going where? Isaiah chapter 66, verse, um, verse, well, let's start in verse 22. So Isaiah 66, verse 22. You got it? Almost. Okay. okay. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, okay, okay, that's still sometime in our future, isn't it? So just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, will endure before me, it is a declaration of Adonai, so your descendants and your name will endure. Mm -hmm. And it will come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh will come down, will come to bow down before me, says Adonai. From one Shabbat to the next. Remember what we said about heaven and earth. Heaven and earth were witnesses against the people, according to Torah. That they would keep the terms of the, of the covenant. Because God knew they weren't going to keep it, right? And so here, those witnesses that witness against the people are gone, and it's a new heaven and a new earth. How about that? A new heaven and a new earth to witness that God's people are now going to obey him. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We are so in it's... a period of, of new heaven, new earth. The king is on the throne forever. Mm -hmm. And the, Shabbat the, is in force. The, yeah. Sorry. The new heaven <laughs> and the new earth are no longer testifying against us. They are testifying for us Amen. that we are keeping uh, the the covenant and that is a powerful powerful thing that's a powerful change from where we are now you know now we the heaven and earth testify that we we all that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god and in the kingdom the heaven and the new heaven and the new earth are going to testify that uh, for all have been redeemed all are honoring and glorifying God yes. in their lives and in their practice in their body. The earth, the heaven and earth today, are they're 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 groaning for their own redemption. Mm -hmm. They're groaning to be fixed, and so when God fixes them, when God gives the earth and the heavens, when he, when creation, all of creation is redeemed they can start to testify again for God's people and not against God's people. Mm -hmm. And they look forward to that day. You don't really think about that, but they do. They look forward to that day. Romans 7 and 8 yes. talk about that. Yes. All creation, you know, is groaning for the sons of God to be revealed. Now, I want to end this discussion on Shabbat in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament. I want us to go back to the Torah. I want us to go back to Leviticus. Okay, Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23 is where God actually gives the children of Israel their, his feasts. Okay, when he tells them, this is when I want you to come and worship me. All right, and it's important because, well, let's, let's start reading in verse 1 of chapter 23. And let's go through verse 4. Mm -hmm. okay, you want to read it? So then Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Bnei Israel, the children of Israel, and tell them, These are the appointed Moadim. Remember, Moadim means appointed times. Or, or These are my appointed, I'm sorry, These are the appointed Moadim of Adonai, which you are to proclaim to be holy convocations. My Moadim, my feasts. Yes. So they, they, he's identifying that these are belonging to him, first of all. They are his authority. They are his framework. They, they are, are his appointments uh, that he wants to set up. He says, work may be done for six days, but the seventh day is a Shabbat of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You are to do no work. It is a Shabbat to Adonai in all your dwellings. And then these are the appointed feasts of Adonai, holy convocations, which you are to proclaim in their appointed season. Okay. 
we're not going to go through the, the, the feasts, the yearly feasts. But I wanted to point out, I think we needed to point out that the weekly Shabbat is the pattern for every everything else. Mm -hmm. The weekly Shabbat is the pattern that God puts in place for the rest of his feasts. And so it is that weekly constant reminder where they are to hold holy convocations. What's that sound like? Hey, y'all, let's go to church. Let's mm -hmm. go to synagogue. Let's get together. Let's talk about God. Let's worship God, right? What, what's coming up it, next? You know, that's when they would announce when the when the, the up yearly feasts are taking place. Right. They'll help each other get ready for those things. Absolutely. So, yeah, and these, these um, feasts are patterned off of Shabbat. And so when the New Testament mentions... Um, I'm going to give something a little bit away here. But when the New Testament actually mentions um, the first day of the week, there's, it's actually a referring question of translation. back to um, the Shabbats. And so when we, um, and we'll talk about that tomorrow night. Okay. We will talk about that tomorrow night. But Suffice it to say that these the, the Shabbat is a special day to the Lord. It is a holy day to him. And we are to keep it. We are to observe it because it is the sign that God has given us that we belong to him. Mm -hmm. yes. And it's a sign that, that the king is coming and he will be on the throne forever. Mm -hmm. And so and it is the first of the Moedim. It is yes. the first of the appointed times, the days of appointment. That he wants to meet with his his people. So again, there are some feasts only happen once a year, uh, but other feasts happen. The other feasts happen fifty two times a year. There, these other appointed days happen fifty two times a year at a minimum. The weekly Shabbat. It's one of those, and it's just as important as those because this is also one of the days that is primary, where a, a primary teaching day about. The things of God, mm. you know, we if we only got a lesson once a year, we probably wouldn't remember it very well. But we need we need lessons, we need reminders, we need support and structure every week, and that's a good thing. Meeting together on a weekly basis is a good thing, and we yes. need that. So again, he has built that in to his structure of the world and how he wants his people to live. And the Sabbath is essential to that. So we will talk about the Sabbath in the New Testament tomorrow and mm -hmm. get a little more specific. And we will be talking uh, some about translation tomorrow because it is very important and very vital in our understanding of Shabbat in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, so get ready. Get ready for a study tomorrow. And uh, we hope to see you here then tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Yep, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, and be sure if you do have any questions or, or things that you want to see addressed, remember to leave them in a comment or an email, and we see a few of y'all watching, Dorothy and Susan, uh, so be sure and, uh, and share this where you can, and, uh, and we'd love to get as many people to see this as possible, because these are important discussions for the times that we are in, because yes. if the kingdom is going to be where the Shabbat is, is kept, and then we need to start orienting our life in that direction as well. And that's an important call yeah. for the people of God. That's one reason why you see in synagogues and the Jewish people, they, they turn and face toward Jerusalem. You know, they are, it's a literal fig, uh, physical act of orienting their life toward the kingdom of God. That is the throne going to be uh, the reign of God in Jerusalem. So, we need to start doing that too. And the Shabbat is one of those ways of doing that. So thank so, y'all for joining us. With that, may the Lord bless y'all. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, for tonight. This was day seven of the Omer count. So we're at, we'll be at the end of the first week of the Omer count. So mm -hmm. tomorrow night we will be going into week two. So we're moving right along. Yep. May the Lord bless y'all. Have a good night. Shalom. Shalom.